Hi, I'm Jacqueline. And I'm Courtney. And this is Caffeinated Crimes. So I know you guys just heard us last week because we recorded up a whole bunch for you guys before we took like a three week, I think, recording break. So I think so. Yeah. Courtney and I are sitting here like, I don't even, it, I couldn't even figure out how to record for a minute. I'm like, where is this button? What am I supposed to click? I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm so confused. Yeah. I'm like a little nervous. I feel like I'm going to be a little rusty. And then like, we're recording on like a Tuesday and we were talking mm-hmm. about how we made the post today for last week. And we were like, what is this episode about? That was seven years ago. I yeah. remember what your perk of the week was. What was my perk of the week? It was that you went to Target and found what you were looking for and bought it. That's what it was. Because I was struggling. Because <laughs> uh, shout out to Catherine. She messaged us today where her favorite high-waisted shorts are. Oh, so I didn't see that. I'm going to have to look. To me. Thank you, Catherine, because I do need some high-waisted shorts. Well, they're at Macy's, so you're going to have to order online <laughs> or drive yeah. to okay. Nashville, Cincinnati, Asheville, Atlanta. Perfect. I'll make a weekend Johnson out of City? it. It's great. Chattanooga? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Let's list all of the Macy's in the Tennessee area for everyone who's concerned. <laughs> yes, I know all of them. <laughs> also, like I said, it's like nine o'clock on a Tuesday night and like I put my daughter down to go to sleep and then I was like, you know what I need to do? I need to deep clean my refrigerator, even though we're going to record in like 35 minutes. But I was like, Mm -hmm. no, this is a great time. So I took every single thing out of my fridge, like took every shelf and drawer out. And then it was like 8.15. And I was like, I'm going to have to text Courtney and be like, I fucked up. (laughs) (laughs) I messed up. But I made it happen. And by that, I also mean my husband happened to walk by and saw me. So he kind of jumped in and, you know, helped as well. So that made it go a lot quicker because I was like oh I'm way I'm I'm way too deep (laughs) this was a mistake yeah I also started um frantically cleaning today because I mean our house wasn't like messy but it's not like super clean and then we were gone for a month basically so things have just been neglected a little bit around here but we put in a work order for this like suspicious spot in our bathroom Mm. um so I was like oh my gosh what if they come immediately so I'm like sweeping up all the cat hair because basically our (laughs) biggest issue is just um what are those things called that are in the desert (laughs) like oh the tumbleweeds they they roll the tumbleweeds of cat Mm -hmm. hair everywhere that's just what it is is tumbleweeds of cat hair um just everywhere so then I was like sweeping them all up frantically and they didn't even come today so (laughs) Well, at least your floors are nice and clean, so that helps. Yeah, they're not mopped, but they don't you know, have tumbleweeds. <laughs> you got the tumbleweeds? That's all that matters? Just don't um, look too closely. <laughs> right. You're like, don't get down on my floor with a magnifying glass. Yeah, I, you know, as someone with three pets, very much mm-hmm. understand the hair struggle. It is. The hair and the cat hard. litter, like, down where the yes. litter boxes are, it's like they sprint out of there like a bat out of hell, and then it's yeah. just like litter all up the first three stairs and no matter how many times you vacuum it or sweep it it's always there so yeah I will say the cabinet that we got to like hide the litter box helps a lot with that because there's like a little like there's like an entryway and then the litter box so then they have to like go through the entryway and then come out so they he still spills it but it's not the volume isn't as bad because it's kind of trickled out through the entryway first yeah we have a mat underneath Mm -hmm. them that catches a lot but still not enough yeah (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, this was a little unhinged, but we know we, uh, yeah. What more could you expect from us after three weeks off? And, and you know, I just remembered I talk in. first. So, um, and as far as updates, I'm sure there's a million true crimes up- updates out there. But as I said, I've been on vacation for basically a month at this point. And when I wasn't <laughs> on vacation, I was just trying to stay alive um, and survive yeah. until the next vacation. So I don't know what's happening in the world. <laughs> Yeah, I also, I kind of never really know what's happening in the world. (laughs) So, you know, we're just. (laughs) Oh, I did see something recently Mm -hmm. um, when we were talking about the Long Island serial killer and we were talking about how the guy was arrested and you know how like Mm -hmm. all the information was kind of there and the guy like botched it. That guy just recently got arrested. Oh. The old police chief or whatever. I don't think it's for this. I think it was for like soliciting a sex worker or something which he was like known to do back then but he's been arrested wow for like wow whatever he's doing and he probably will get a bunch of charges for covering up this other guy and it's like okay so he didn't really dig into these crimes too much because a lot of them were against sex workers but he 
likes to frequent sex workers. Mm -hmm. Wow. But that's why they think that he wouldn't let the FBI in because Mm -hmm. they would then be like, oh my gosh, you're doing a lot of crimes. So he was like, yeah, it's fine. Nobody cares. Nobody cares about them except he's frequenting them. So. Wow. That's, um, so I didn't see that that happened like just recently, but anything else at a loss. (laughs) Yeah. Um, we do have a personal podcast update, though, because we do want to give a shout out to our newest patron, Jennifer. Um, so at this point, girl, I'm sorry, it's been like two months because by the time we recorded and then recording this and then, you know, getting it out there by the time you're hearing this. But I did I did, you know, message you. So we, we have communicated. Um, but this is your official live shout out uh thank you so much for joining the patreon we really really appreciate it yeah i did feel so bad because we had just recorded like three in a row and then she joined and i was like oh we already edited everything and i just don't (laughs) think we can go in there (laughs) yep i don't think we can i'm so sorry but you're you're getting your shout out now so yes and you did receive yes and you did receive your sticker and pin you already messaged me that and let me know so that made it there. So excited about that. Um, and of course, just to give a little plug while we're on the subject, if you guys want your own Caffeinated Crimes sticker and pin, you can also join our Patreon and also get this lovely shout out. So that is patreon.com slash Caffeinated Crimes. Just going to plug that in here at the beginning. And again, thank you so much, Jennifer. We do really, really appreciate it. Yes, we really do. All right. We have a bit of a doozy today. So yeah. we're going to go ahead and get into it. So our sources for this week's episode um, is a Our Life documentary, Harold Shipman, Dr. Death, an All That's Interesting article, and two articles from the National Library of Medicine. I bet you can't figure out what the topic is today. Yeah, no idea. Based on those sources. <laughs> Does anybody skip the sources so it's like not a spoiler? Oh, interesting. Let us Probably know. not, but let me know. Dr. Harold Shipman was a well-respected general practitioner in Manchester, England. His patients trusted him quite literally with their lives. But what many patients didn't know was that Dr. Harold Shipman murdered over 215 of his patients in England over the course of 25 years. So if those sources were not spoiler enough, the intro paragraph was. So there you go. You know what's about to happen now. <laughs> So Harold Frederick Shipman was born in Nottingham in 1946. His father was a lorry driver. He was a very bright student and played rugby in school. He was very close to his mother and was devastated when she was diagnosed with lung cancer when he was 17 years old and passed away shortly after at the age of 42. Shipman married his girlfriend Primrose May Oxtaby in 1966 and went on to study medicine at Leeds University Medical School. The couple had four children together and Shipman graduated medical school in 1970. He started going by the name Fred around this time. So Shipman started working as a junior doctor, but moved up to a general practitioner in 1974 and was working in the town of Todmorden in West Yorkshire. The next year, Shipman was arrested by a local detective for writing and possessing illegal prescriptions for Demerol. So Demerol is an opioid used to treat pain, and Shipman had become addicted and was using his medical license to supply his own addiction, very much like my former dentist. So, Oh, oh, that's good. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, he, he used whatever they use in, like, dentistry, I guess, like the pain medication they can prescribe you for, like, a root canal or Uh whatever. I guess he was writing prescriptions for himself oh. and he had to sell his business. Well, kind of. He had to get like a co-owner. <laughs> He's so. like, I need someone to take over because I cannot handle this. <laughs> I lost shit on all my, my money. <laughs> I lost all my money. <laughs> Yikes. That's um that is concerning. Let us know if you have a doctor or dentist in your life who you know this happened to, because I feel like it has to be semi-common because if we're telling a story about it, I know someone, yeah. maybe my life is just batshit crazy and <laughs> I know weird people, but you know, you know, Courtney, I will say your taste in dentist has improved because the one that you recommended to me, I had my appointment this week and it was wonderful. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. She's very lovely. Everyone there is lovely. Yes. Um, I, I mean, mean hope- she, go ahead. I mean, hopefully they're not lovely because they're all on opioids, but you know, <laughs> they're just really happy for a certain reason. No, but my <laughs> no, dad works with fantastic. a lot of dentists in Knoxville and anytime anyone needs a recommendation, he's like, 
that woman. Yeah. She's the best. <laughs> um, it, it was funny because she asked me, like, because she knew that I just, like, moved back to the area. You know, it was my first time there or whatever. And she's like, oh, like, how did you find us? And um, I was like, oh, like, I'm I'm friends with Dan Irwin's daughter. And she was like, oh, my gosh, we love Dan. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, I kind of felt like a celebrity going in there because yeah. I put a note in my chart because my last name's different now, which is part of the reason I didn't want to change my last name because for dentist, I have, like, some Right? You're like, people know royalty. the Irwin's here, okay? We don't need to yeah, be changing they'll, like, look in my Yeah, they'll look in my chart and they're like... <gasps> I just love your mom and dad. <laughs> yes, like they they were super excited. And it was also funny because I was thinking about it after I left that. And I was like, it's really weird to like describe you as my friend because like, I'm like, that doesn't. It's deeper than that. Exactly. I'm like, that word just like, oh, yeah, I'm friends with his daughter. And I'm like, no, like she's my soulmate. <laughs> like this isn't. <laughs> she's <laughs> my person. And but, but you can't tell a stranger that because then it gets weird. But I was like, yeah. it just seems like. I don't know, just uh, woefully underrepresented. <laughs> yeah, that's always hard, like trying to describe. It's like, I know I'm just saying it's my friend or my best friend, but like, you, you don't get exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, you don't, like, no, like, yes, you don't understand. Anyway, sorry, guys. Big side tangent, but okay. Where was I? Oh, he said he started using the drugs because of stress, but he got hooked. Um, he cast confessed to being an addict and said he had no future intention to return to general practice. He was fired from that position, fined 600 pounds and required to attend rehab. So despite these police records being submitted to the medical board, they determined he was not a danger to the public and he was allowed to continue practicing medicine. His next position was 30 miles away at Donnybrook Medical Center in Hyde, where he started in 1977. So here he kind of started to rebuild his reputation as a trustworthy doctor and would fool patients and their families for the next two decades. And in 1993, he started his own practice on Market Street in the center of Hyde. So the older generation really liked him because he took the time to answer their questions and give them individualized attention. Um, he also did home visits, which was really important to this age group. Like you're older, it's kind of hard to have someone drive you, drive yourself, get out sometimes. So it's really great to just kind of have someone come straight to your house. <laughs> I mean, I'd like that too, personally, if someone could just do a home visit and I don't have to go sit in a waiting room for 30 minutes. <laughs> I mean, think about how much time you would save in your life, not having to sit in waiting rooms. Like how much you don't time? have to go walk into the office and stand there and wait for them to call your name, mm -hmm. write down your name, go sit down, have your name called again, fill out the paperwork that you fill out every single time. Yeah. Even if you fill it out online, you got to fill it out in person too. Why is this a thing? Why did you send me an email to fill all this out if you're then going to have to have me fill it out again? Which I will say also was something I also liked about that dentist is they didn't make me fill anything out because I filled it out mm -hmm. online and apparently their systems are connected. So whatever system they're using, everyone needs to use because <laughs> yes. what's going on? But yeah, and I feel like it's such a big thing too, like with the older generations, because like they grew up with doctors being like that and doing home visits. And so it's a kind of comfort mm -hmm. thing to them. And it's it's a deeper level of like care that they're receiving in their old age that they're not getting from other doctors, you know? Yeah. And Dr. Shipman's one-man practice had 3,000 patients on a waiting list. So he was really rebuilt his reputation. Yeah. In the summer of 1998, Detective Bernard Postles received a call from a woman named Angela Woodruff, who was concerned that her mother's will was fraudulent. So her mother was 81 years, 81 year old Kathleen Grundy, and she was the former mayor of Hyde. She had been in decent health before her death, but her will is what really made Angela suspicious. So she had left one of her houses to Dr. Shipman, which is most people don't just leave their house to their doctor not really um, no not very common um that alone was suspicious to angela but what's even more suspicious is that kathleen grundy owned two homes but only one of them's mentioned in her will so angela didn't believe that kathleen had written the will herself and she also didn't think that the grammar used in the will matched what her mother would have written so earlier that year, Undertakers and Hyde reported concerns to the local coroner that too many of Shipman's patients had recently died. So the local coroner contacted the Greater Manchester Police, and Shipman's death rate was 10 times higher than the other practitioners in the area, which is quite a bit higher. That's, that's <laughs> quite, a bit. quite a lot, yeah. 
But because all of Shipman's recently deceased patients had legitimate illnesses listed in their medical records, there was no deeper investigation into Harold Shipman, um, and his criminal records were not reviewed at this time either. He did have a lot of elderly patients, so they're like, I mean, I guess it's going to happen when you typically only tend to older people. Yeah. So the previous concerns, along with Kathleen Grundy's suspected fraudulent will, led to search warrants being executed on Dr. Shipman's surgery, which is the British word for like a doctor's office. So um, so Dr. Shipman handed over a typewriter and said Miss Grundy had borrowed it sometimes. Um, another casual thing, just borrowing a typewriter from your doctor. <laughs> yeah, right. We're just we're just close like that. Just borrow his typewriter yeah. when I need it. So experts determined that Miss Grundy's will was written on the typewriter in Dr. Shipman's surgery because one of the keys didn't press down correctly and left a distinct letter that was also on Miss Grundy's will. So they're like, this kind of adds up. That's pretty unique. So we think mm-hmm. definitely written on this. So detectives interviewed Dr. Shipman and said he didn't, and he said he didn't know anything about this and that Miss Grundy must have written her will during one of the occasions that she borrowed his typewriter. Her death certificate was examined, and while it stated that she died of natural causes, there was no medical records to support this. She had been in good health and was just out walking just days before her death. So it's not like she's been bedridden for weeks, anything like that. Like, she was in good health, walking, Mm -hmm. and now suddenly she's dead. Yeah. So police decided to have her body exhumed for testing. Um, This was the first ever exhumation carried out by the Greater Manchester Police, and it was conducted at 3 a.m. underneath tents so that it wouldn't be too obvious to the public, but it was still pretty noisy. I mean, digging, like, the the sounds of the... Yeah. Excavator? Excavator makes sense. I think that's what it's called. (laughs) but I'm not positive. Anyway, those, yeah. those are pretty loud. So, which this also made me think, you know, I've never really like read too much into it or whatever, but is this a common practice to like do exhumations in the middle of the night? Because obviously it's a very like sensitive thing. It's a, mm-hmm. I don't want to say awkward, but it's uncomfortable. You know, if you're just like in a cemetery visiting your loved one and you're like, oh, they're bringing someone else's loved one up out of the ground. Like, do you just like, when do you do that? How do you, like, do you close things down? I feel like, like it would have to be at night. Because, like, I know also from, like, the, like, graveside services I've been to, mm-hmm. they won't start burying them until the entire family leaves. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever, like, seen that. Like, mm-hmm. they won't lower the casket and start, like, burying them until everyone leaves. Because yeah. they're, like, people don't need to see this. Mm-hmm. So, I would think. But. Yeah. I just thought it was I interesting because they mentioned that in the documentary. And I was, like, oh, like, that makes sense. But, like, I've never, like put any kind of thought into the logistics of that you know yeah and four weeks after the exhumation lethal levels of dimorphine were found in kathleen grundy's body so dr shipman tried to suggest that miss grundy had taken the lethal dose herself he said he'd previously wondered if she was taking more drugs than he was prescribing to her and hinted that she might have a drug problem On September 7th, 1998, Dr. Harold Frederick Shipman was finally arrested for the murder of Kathleen Grundy. Meanwhile, a local newspaper started receiving tips linking Shipman to the deaths of many other elderly patients, and the Manchester Evening News started looking into these tips. They spoke with local residents and learned that many people had called Dr. Shipman Dr. Death because so many elderly patients under his care had passed away. So this story became national news, and there were There are video clips of journalists trying to speak with Dr. Shipman on the street, and many families of Shipman's deceased patients heard the news and were worried that their family members had also been murdered by Shipman. So the police had to go speak to all of the family members who expressed concerns about their own loved ones, and detectives became overwhelmed as new victims emerged. Within a few weeks, there were 17 suspected murders, and that soon increased to 62. So it's like... This started and then it's just like an avalanche of people coming forward. And when Dr. Shipman was arrested, he wanted to be interviewed by top detectives. An An examination of his computer showed that he had tampered with the medical records of a woman named Winifred Miller. He had fabricated a false history of heart disease in the months leading up to her death. On the day she died, he went to her house at 3 a.m., administered a lethal dose of morphine, then went back to his surgery, where he altered her medical records and fabricated a death certificate. So when detectives asked Dr. Shipman about this, he said, no, 
that's not what happened. And then went silent and refused to answer any additional questions. So they eventually took him back to his cell where he appeared to have a mental breakdown. Britain, Britain's leading forensic psychiatrist, Dr. Richard Badcock, was called in for an examination to decipher what Shipman's behavior could mean. Dr. Badcock's report said Shipman was hostile, showed no remorse, and was hollowed out as a man. So he didn't think he would ever confess to the murders he committed, and Dr. Badcock declared Shipman mentally fit and able to continue with questioning, but Shipman still wouldn't co cooperate with police. During questioning, he would close his eyes and turn his back when detectives spoke to him and showed him photos of the victims. And on October 13th, another 11 bodies were exhumed and all showed lethal levels of morphine. So detectives had enough to charge Dr. Harold Shipman with 15 counts of murder. In addition to Kathleen Grundy, Shipman was charged with the deaths of Joan Malia, Winifred Miller, Bianca Pomfret, Ivy Lomas, Marie Quinn, Irene Turner, Jean Lilly, Muriel Grimshaw, Nora Nuttall, Laura Wagstaff, Maureen Ward, Pamela Hiller, Marie West, and Lizzie Adams. So many people were confused because Dr. Shipman cared for so many patients that he did not murder. Um, he actually seemed to carefully choose who to kill and who to provide excellent medical care to. So Shirley Horsfall was a close family friend and said that Dr. Shipman cared for her terminally ill mother and gave her the best treatment that he could. Few people questioned their doctors at this time because they were trusted and well-respected, and no one realized that the time and attention he devoted to the elderly community was really just grooming them. And in 1982, Dr. Shipman appeared on a TV documentary about mental illness, and investigators would later realize that he was already killing his patients during that time. So it is very eerie. You have this, like, recording of him, you know, talking about, like, his expertise in the field, and you're like, you were literally mm -hmm. killing your patients during this same time period. Yeah. So Dr. Harold Shipman's murder trial began on October 11th, 1999, and he was 54 years old. So the 15 murders he was charged with took place between 1995 and 1998. Um, the trial lasted for 57 days, and the whole time Shipman just looked annoyed and downright insulted that he was being accused of this. He was found guilty of 15 counts of murder, and the day after his conviction, a public inquiry was launched in Manchester to uncover the true scale of his crimes. So over 900 patient records were examined, and Shipman just refused to cooperate with the inquiry. He was later moved to a prison in Wakefield. Um, so Ray Robert was the head of operations there, and he referenced prison reports that Shipman was condescending, arrogant, and obnoxious. So two inmates who had been seen talking to Shipman later overdosed on black market prescription drugs, and they believed that Shipman was responsible. So the two inmates survived, but did refuse to cooperate with authorities. Shipman's wife, Primrose, was never arrested, and it is believed that she had no idea what Shipman was doing for so many years. So just going to give a quick suicide trigger warning for the next couple of sentences. Um, so Shipman worked in the textile shop in prison, and in January of 2004, he died by suicide by sneaking remnants of the textiles into his cell and making a noose. So he told the prison official that he planned on dying by suicide so that his wife Primrose could have his pension. The day after Shipman's death, an article ran in the newspaper about him. Um, so a woman named Sandra Whitehead read the article and realized that she worked with Shipman in 1972 at Pontefract General Hospital. Um, he was still a junior doctor then, and Sandra remembered that he was always in a hurry. She also remembered that one night when he was working there, there were three deaths in one night. So all of the patients had been ill, but none had like immediate warning signs that like they were going to die then so it's not mm -hmm. it wasn't something like super alarming where they're like wow this came out of nowhere but you know normally you have like signs in the last couple of days or hours that you can know it's coming and they kind of came out of nowhere in that regard yeah so sandra was 18 years old at the time so she didn't report her concerns then she's like you know here's this doctor who knows what he's doing and like who am i and i'm not going to put myself in the middle of this but after hearing the news all those years later, Sandra reported her concerns, and those deaths were included in the public inquiry. So officers determined that Shipman was responsible for 15 deaths at Pontefract General Hospital, and overall, the public inquiry found that Dr. Shipman's killing spree lasted for 27 years, and he took the lives of at least 215 of his patients. 
So in addition to the 15 deaths at Pontefract, Dr. Shipman was found responsible for one death in Todd Morden and 215 in Hyde. So Dr. Shipman murdered 171 women and 44 men, and he is suspected of murdering another 45 people as well. So Shipman would inject his patients with lethal doses of morphine, either at his surgery or at their homes during a house call, and would then cover his tracks with the death certificate and previous falsified medical records to back up the illness they died of. So one of Dr. Shipman's victims was Irene Barry. Um, her two daughters described her as bubbly, social, and outgoing. They said that she loved to talk to people, and she thought that everyone should smile at someone when they pass by them on the street. So she really just enjoyed people and was friendly to people and wanted to feel mm -hmm. that connection to others. Um, and unfortunately, she's the only victim other than Kathleen Grundy that we have any other like detailed information about as far as who they were as a person. Um, obviously, we would love to include more information about these victims here, but that's the only detailed information that we have. Um, but we do want to remember all of Dr. Shipman's victims, so we are going to list them here. It's probably going to take about eight to ten minutes, so just wanted to give you all a heads give up. Give you a heads up. We're going to read <laughs> yeah. 200 names, so here we go. But we do want to remember and acknowledge all of the lives that he took. So these were the murders of... Lizzie Adams, Rose Ann Adshead, Irene Aitken, Dorothy Mary Andrew, Mary Emma Andrew, Winifred Aerosmith, Netta Ashcroft, Dora Elizabeth Ashton, Ada Ashworth, Brenda Ashworth, Elizabeth Ashworth, Sarah Ashworth, which I don't know if that's a common name or if this was an entire Like family. all related. Yeah. Yeah, because a few more coming up are all... Okay, these are all different addresses, same so name. must just be... I mean, I guess if you have 200 people, you're bound to have some with same last names. Yeah. You're going to have a few, whatever the equivalent of Smith is in England. Yeah. <laughs> um, Elizabeth Mary Badley, Joseph Bardsley, Lily Bardsley, Nellie Bardsley, Elsie Barker, Charles Henry Barlow, Elizabeth Battersby, Ethel Bennett, Nellie Bennett, Charlotte Bennison, Arthur Bent, Irene Berry, Violet May Bird, Alice Black... Joffrey Bogle, Edith Brady, Harold Bramwell, Vera Bramwell, Nancy Ann Brassington, Doris Bridge, Lily Broadbent, Edith Brock, Charles Edward Brocklehurst, Elizabeth Mary Burke, Edith Calvary, Annie Campbell, Marion Car Carides, Irene Chapman, Wilfred Chapel, John Charlton, Albert Cheatham, Elsie Cheatham, Thomas Cheatham, Fanny Clark, Beatrice Helen Clee, Alice Hilda Conofton, Margaret Ann Conway, Ann Cooper, Erla Copeland, Annie Coulter, Mary Coots, Hilda Mary Cousins, Eileen Teresa Cox, Eileen Daphne Crompton, Frank Crompton, John Crompton, Lily Crossley, Lillian Cullen, Valerie Cuthbert, Kissy Pat Davies, Fanny Dawson, Elsie Lorna Dean, Joan Edwina Dean, Ronnie Devonport, Mary Rose Dudley, Doris Earls, Harold Edelson, Bethel Ann Evans, Joseph Vincent Everall, Marie Antoinette Fernley, Hilda Fitton, Dorothy Fletcher, Elizabeth Fletcher, Leah Fogg, Edwin Folks, Thomas Fowden, Maura Moira Ashton Fox, Harold Freeman, Minnie Doris Irene Galpin, Rose Garlic, Millicent Garside, William Gibbons, Elsie Godfrey, Alice Maud Gorton, John Sheard Greenhalgh, Muriel Grimshaw, Kathleen Grundy, Clara Hackney, Violet Hadfield, Josephine Hall, Frank Halliday, Mary Emma Hamer, Christine Hancock, Elsie Hannibal, Joan Harding, Charles Harris, David Harrison, Samuel Harrison, Elsie Harrop, Clifford Heapy, Irene Heathcote, Olive Hagenbotham, Florence Haywood, Hilda Hibbert, Robert Hickson, Lily Higgins, Marion Hyam, Ellen Higson, Pamela Hillier, Ada Hilton, John Hilton, Alice Holt, Dorothy Hopkins, John Howcroft, Joseph 
Iwanina, Maureen Lamanier Jackson, Nancy Jackson, Leah Johnston, Alice Mary Jones, David Jones, Jane Jones, Mary Ellen Jordan, Fred Kellett, Ethel May Kellett, Alice Kennedy, Charles Henry Killen, James Joseph King, Alice Christine Kitchen, Renee Lacey, Carrie Lee, Joseph Lee, Wilfred Lee, Florence Lewis, Peter Lewis, Jean Lilly, Robert Henry Lingard, Laura Francis Lynn, John Loudon Livesey, Edna May Llewellyn, Ivy Lomas, Dorothy Long, Thomas Alfred Longmate, Beatrice Lowe, Mary Lowe, Eva Lyons, Charles McConnell, Selena McKenzie, Walter Mansfield, Martha Marley, Sarah Hannah Marsland, Kathleen McDonald, Joan May Melia, Elizabeth Ellen Meller, Winifred Miller, Deborah Middleton, Samuel Mills, John Bennett Molesdale, Emily Morgan, Bertha Moss, Hannah Helena Mottram, Thomas Molt, Fanny Nichols, Nora Nuttall, Enid Otter, Conrad Peter Ofcar Robinson, Renate Eltrod Overton, Marjorie Parker, Bertha Parr, Elizabeth Pierce, Mavis Pickup, Elsie Platt, Bianca Pomfret, Annie Powers, Alice Prestwich, Marie Quinn, Anne Lillian Ralphs, Dorothea Hill Renwick, Josie Kathleen Diana Richards, Edith Roberts, Gladys Roberts, Eileen Robinson, Lavinia Robinson, Mildred Robinson, Elizabeth Ann Rogers, Jane Frances Rostron, Dorothy Roworth, Jane Rowland, Elsie Royals, Betty Royston, Ernest Rudolph, Tom Balfour Russell, Gladys Saunders, Edith Scott, Elsie Scott, Kate Sellers, Cicely Sharples, Joseph Shaw, Maybell Shawcross, Jack Shelmerdine, Jane Shelmerdine, Elizabeth Sigley, Lena Slater, May Slater, Kenneth Ernest Smith, Mary Alice Smith, Sydney Arthur Smith, Monica Renee Sparks, Harry Stafford, Louisa Stocks, John Stone, Arthur Henderson Stopford, Bessie Swan, Florence Taylor, Lily Taylor Newby, Alice Thomas, Maria Thornton, Angela Philomena Tierney, Walter Tingle, Beatrice Toft, Mary Tomlin, Margaret Townsend, Dorothy Tucker, Irene Turner, Mary Tuff, Francis Elizabeth Turner, Frederick Vickers, Margaret Mary Vickers, Lucy Virgin, George Edgar Visser, Laura Kathleen Wagstaff, Margaret Waldron, Henrietta Walker, Marjorie Hope Waller, Mary Walls, Ada War Burton, Marine Alice Ward, Muriel Margaret Ward, Percy Ward, Eric Wardle, Annie Watkins, Maria West, Lavinia Warmby, Mona Ashton White, Amy Whitehead, Vera Whittingslow, Edith Wiberly, Joseph Wilcoxon, Albert Redvers Williams, Sarah Jane Williamson, Mary Winterbottom, James Wood, Joyce Woodhead, and Kenneth Wormby Woodhead. So, wow, that is the list of victims. And it took us, I don't really know how long, probably a really long time to just read that because, and I guess those are known victims. There's probably even more possible victims. Yeah. And also shout out to the Manchester Evening News yes. for putting that all together. They had like their name, age, like date of death and um like kind of address like kind of where they were and city yeah so shout out to them for putting that all together because i'm sure that took a long time absolutely and this is the first time in one of these cases that we've actually gotten a comprehensive list like you said at least as far as those that we're aware of but so many times you see oh like you know this huge number and then you can't find any victims names Mm -hmm. anywhere so we really appreciate that they 
took the time to do that, that we were able to share at least their names with you. I know it's not the same as sharing a victim story and information about who they were as a person, but at least their names are out there and can be remembered. And again, think of the time it took us to read through those names and just imagine that many people and all of the people connected to each one of those people. And that's Mm -hmm. how many lives this one person has destroyed. It's just, it's unfathomable, really. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like, you can't even really think about it. It's like, yeah, like every person was probably a child of someone, a spouse of someone, a partner, a friend, a mother, a father, Yeah, you know, like a grandmother, a grandfather, like, because especially these were like older people and, you know, those any years we get on life are like cherished Mm -hmm. but especially you know you're 82 in 1986 like you maybe you still have a lot of life left in you and a lot of years that you want to be there for and this man just like strips that away for whatever reason and that's the thing he's never given any kind of motive um there was one thing i read that was like a suspected motive but there's no There's nothing to back it up, so we didn't really include it in the main part of the episode. Um, But people speculate that when his mother was dying and he, like, saw the doctors giving her morphine that, like, eased her pain, that it, like, flipped the switch in him that he's like, oh, I have to, like, end the suffering of other people and, like, I can make them free of pain as well. But it's like, but they weren't in pain. Like, these aren't mercy killings. Like, these aren't. Yeah. These are This is a very different situation. Um. Maybe we'll cover doctors who were like that at some point because there are doctors who they truly like assisted suicide and that sort of thing. This Mm -hmm. is not this case. These people, some of them were sick. Many of them were not. And the ones that were sick were not like actively dying kind of sick, you know? Yeah. And it's insane too, because only like one of them, did he like alter a will where it seems like financial, I mean, that I know of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I feel like if he'd altered other wills or gotten stuff from other people, but it's like just this one time he's like okay i'm gonna get something like physical financial Mm. whatever out of it so it's just like yeah some people speculated too that like he just got greedy and like he'd been doing this for so long and then he had this like wealthier Mm -hmm. lady and was like oh like i can like get something out of this too so no one's caught me so i can just yeah exactly exactly but yeah that is the crazy dr death dr harold frederick shipman um yeah that being said courtney what is your Awkward transition always <laughs> um perk of the week so my perk of the week is just i've had a pretty great month of august mm-hmm. so far it's been i know it's like end of august by the time you hear <laughs> this but the last time we recorded i think it was still july yeah. so um Basically, we started out the month with Kevin's 30th birthday. I surprised him with a trip to New York uh, City, not just like upstate New York, (laughs) like the city. And his brothers met us there. And so we just got to have like a really good time. Um, And then we went on vacation with his family. So we got to go to Pittsburgh and then um, Niagara Falls, Toronto. On our way home, we stopped in Detroit to get some pizza because we had like an 11 hour drive home. So we just made the most of it. um, And it was really great, but I just do want to be like, don't, you know, I posted a little highlight reel. So Mm -hmm. don't let social media fool you because on New York, our flight was canceled and we were (laughs) stranded at the airport at 9 PM. We had to drive home. Um, Our game got canceled in Pittsburgh and we had to alter plans. Like things went wrong. So Mm -hmm. my little 10 picture highlight reel looks real nice, but uh, (laughs) there was a lot of shit in between. (laughs) So, but you know, it left you with a lot of funny stories that, Probably aren't too True. funny yet, but like a few years from now will be great stories, you know? The the New York story is funny now yeah. that it's like done with like us at 9 p.m. being like, well, we're renting a car <laughs> after being up for like not going to bed last night until two to three in the morning. Mm-hmm. Now being up all day. Now we're going to rent a car at 9 p.m. and start a 10 hour drive home. So. Yeah. Good times. Good times. But- <laughs> It worked out. But basically, American Airlines was like, the next flight we can get you is Tuesday. (laughs) Or you can pay a $100 Uber to the next airport and maybe fly out Monday. But then we saw like tons of flights were canceled Mm -hmm. Monday and Tuesday. So we made the right choice. It just really sucked. Yeah, (laughs) for sure. um, 
it was overall fun though. It's fun memories, fun stories. Um, but anyone on looking looks like me and Kevin are just living the dream. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> we've been in like so many cities in the last three weeks, basically. <laughs> yeah, you guys have been very busy this month. Like anytime I see my family yeah. and they're like, Oh, like where's Courtney? And I was like, Oh, like she's at this place today, or she's at this place today. And someone's like, Does she ever work? And I was like, Well, she's working most of this, except for like this past week. The others were like yeah. weekend trips. <laughs> like you just leave like yeah. <laughs> as late as possible and get back as late as possible. <laughs> That's the thing. Nobody saw me here every single day from January to August. And now I take like a whole month off and everyone's like, Do you not work? <laughs> Did you not see the last eight months? <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> like you literally took like what? one full week off and then what maybe like a friday and that was a it. day and a half yeah, yeah. Thir- i took a half day thursday and a day friday and yeah. i guess technically a half day monday but i like worked from the car yeah how i could i'm traveling with my laptop from now on because god knows when you're gonna get stranded somewhere exactly. i guess you never know and and yeah one of those wasn't even like you didn't plan to take that day off you just got stranded and had to because yeah. you weren't back yet i know i just had to do everything i could from my phone which yeah was enough but not a lot yeah for sure but that's my perk of the week is it's been a fun month it's been a tiring month i'm kind of ready to like chill yeah a little at least closer to knoxville not drive um but it's been super fun and like a lot of fun memories and i just love traveling with kevin and it's always fun just getting to make memories like in new places so yeah it's always really fun that is my perk of the week. Jacqueline, what is your perk of the week? So my perk of the week is not nearly as exciting, but um, my perk of the week is that almost two and a half years ago at this point, because I was still pregnant, my husband bought me a hammock for my birthday when I was eight months pregnant. So obviously I was not going to be using the hammock within the next month. You wouldn't get out of the hammock. Exactly. <laughs> like I would get in the hammock and it would be great. And then I would have to call my husband to come get me out of the hammock. <laughs> like I had to have him get me off the couch a few times. But, um, and then, you know, I had a newborn and it was summer and then like you got into fall and then you just get busy with life. And then we're like, oh, we're going to move the next year. So we're not going to put up anything new because we're like doing all of that stuff. And, Anyway, long story short, finally, after two and a half years, I have hung my hammock and it is delightful. Nice. It is a very comfortable hammock. We hung it like underneath our deck. So I have like some shade. And so like, I'm just like looking up like at all my trees, like coming. To- it's just, it is delightful and it is very relaxing. And I also had this lovely vision that I could lay in my hammock while my daughter plays in the yard. I don't know what I was thinking. Like, have I not met my child? As soon as we walk out there, she goes, a swing. And so she runs over to it. And then now she has to swing with mommy every time we go outside and we just lay in the hammock together, yeah. which is also nice. But at least you can get her like contained and it's not like yes. chasing after her. So maybe it's not relaxing, but a little bit more relaxing. It's a little better. Yeah. Until she wants to get in and out of the hammock. And that is a challenge because yeah. it's also because you know my six foot four husband hung it so it's a little higher than I would have hung it but you know so I have to like get in the hammock and then I have to from the ground pick up her entire body and lift it up into the oh, hammock yeah. so that you know just getting a little extra workout in um but after yeah, the in and out I'd be like nah girl it's in or out we exactly ain't doing <laughs> we, like the first day we did it like four times and then she's like oh I want to go out and go to whatever and I was like okay like we're not going to get back in though like you understand we're not going to get back in and she's like okay and then of course like five minutes later she's like go back to swing I'm like no we're all done we're all done with the swing <laughs> mommy's yeah. biceps can't do this anymore <laughs> no more no more swing <laughs> but it is <laughs> very nice and it is like it's a nice big hammock too so like both of us fit comfortably so it is nice to be able to like sit out there with her and relax and then when she goes to bed and I can bring up my drink in my book and just chill in my hammock and I'm I'm loving it. That sounds nice. I have a hammock that's in my garage because I have nowhere to hang it because <laughs> I don't have a yard. Look, um, I have two posts. You can hang it on the other one and we can and I'll just we'll come hammocks together. together. Yes it'll be yes. so nice. <laughs> and then Millie can climb on you too. <laughs> oh, girl, I don't know if I can pick you up like that. I think I could, but I don't know if I trust myself because <laughs> that, that I Aunt Courtney would be the one to drop you on your head. Yeah, so. probably. You know, she's old enough now; it's fine. I mean, when she was like a newborn, I'm like oh, maybe don't drop her. But like at almost two and a half, like girl, roll it down the hill. She's it like, builds character at this point, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You you need a little bit of trauma in your life yeah. to toughen you up. A few bumps and bruises and scrapes. <laughs> uh, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is, but 
Okay, well, if you guys want to tell us your thoughts on this case, as always, um, tell us about your vacations. Where'd you guys go this summer? Where are you going mm-hmm. this fall? I'm going to the beach next week as of this recording. This week, wow, as of the time this comes out, I will be leaving for the beach this week. Almost um, on your way, yeah. Yeah, so very excited about that. Um, let us know what y'all are up to, you know, all the usuals. You guys know where to find us. Um and like we said at the very beginning, we are also on patreon.com slash caffeinated crimes. So if you guys want a shout out at the beginning of the episode, like we gave Jennifer today, if you guys want some stickers and pins like Jennifer got, if you guys want to join our discord, if you want bonus episodes, um, all that fun stuff. We got it. Yeah, Over there. we have an exciting bonus coming out this Thursday. Yes. Last day of the month, you get an exciting bonus. Um. And to anyone, if you did write into CrimeCon advocating for us, thank you. But we were not chosen to be on Podcast Row. But that's okay. We already have our tickets and we're just going to rock out in our merch. Yes. um, Which I need to contact our merch lady and make sure. Like merch lady. That's that's in progress. (laughs) Um, Just just a follow up. Yes. Um, But we'll be there in our merch and we'll be handing out stickers. And so maybe we can get a little bit of networking that way just by being around a bunch of podcast lovers. So. Yes, so um, it's still going to be a very fun time. And there's a, yes. there's a lot of good speakers, guests, people. The coming. list they released today, I was like, this is a good list. Yeah, um, there's a lot of fun names on there. So if you also wouldn't mind to give us five stars on Apple or Spotify, just gets us recognized a little bit more. Um, but in the meantime, go have a cup of coffee. And don't commit a crime. <laughs>